T-minus three, two, one, zero. Hey folks, welcome to the Launch Sequence Podcast. Good to see you. We've got another week, another good space game chat today. And uh, this time we're going to talk about a big surprise, well not a surprise, a very highly anticipated ship actually. We've been waiting for it for quite a while. The Polaris has released on PTU. And we're also going to be taking a look at Star Wars Galaxies, which is an older MMO. Obviously it's Star Wars themed and has a lot of things that kind of tie tie it to Star Citizen in terms of design and how they want the game to play out. I wanted to bring nobody else other than Morphologist on for this talk because we've talked about the Star Wars Galaxies angle before and I know you've played it quite a bit. So we can talk about like the similarities there and how Star Citizen is treading a similar path and also the new ship that has arrived in the PTU and also why it appears you are sitting in the same room as me. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> just, just like uh, he decided this, to this, this theme is my his room, room what do you mean? exactly like mine you know it's not it's not an obsessive trait at all it's completely healthy not at all big fan <laughs> by the way for anybody who's on the audio platform that can't actually see us uh morph is literally it at least appears he's sitting in my room in reality actually, he's like on the other I side of the your, planet i have your mic and your mic stand it'd be super extra hilarious if monster tech sent you the exact same chair as me you have the mic stand? <laughs> I have the same mic stand and mic as you as well. Oh, <laughs> uh, we're like two different, two different flavors of the same SC we, shell. We could actually be in the same room. People would like, if we didn't even say anything, people would have assumed you broke it. Yeah. Oh, man. We just, we just linked up. It's not, it's not hard. California to Taiwan. What's that? A, mm -hmm. a short two hour boat trip, maybe like quick plane flight. No problem. No not problem whatsoever. Not yeah. Not bad. bad. Well, dude, uh, thank you so much for joining me for today. I know it's late over there, but it's never too late to talk spaceships. So I want to I want to no. get us started. Just kick us straight off with uh, some Polaris talk. This is a big ship. People have been waiting. Have you been have you been waiting for this ship? Is it something you've been uh, caring for? It comes in the Star Citizen is exciting. You know, big ships are inherently Uh, hold on a second. Star Sorry. Citizen Spaceship Dreams. So yeah, no, I was excited for the players. It's never been my like my one ship that I always. Oh, I lost. My oh, dang it! Hello, hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. Testing, testing, testing. Test, 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 testing. Hello? No? Nothing at all. I'm not getting anything. This sucks. Test, 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 test. Test, 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 hello, test, testing, one, two, three, hello, hello, testing. Hello, hello, hello. <sighs> test, 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 hello, hello. The GoXLR stopped working. Hello, test. I can't. Now I, it won't let me connect to Discord for whatever reason.
can just use his face, his likeness, you know, and, and just you would see, I would be basically oh my God. hearing his face I'm on back. my stream. It'd be great. Good freaking Lord, jeez. I would just completely take over the podcast, just be an impersonator. So I made the bad mistake of slightly nudging my Go XLR. You know how that goes. Like I used most, to use my one, yeah. Like the most irreliable thing. Like all of the audio depends on that. And if you just bump it a slight, slight nudge, I really need to get, get off of the Go XLR and find something else for this. Yeah. Hey, that uh, Roadcaster Pro 2, man. <laughs> yeah, let me just sell my car first. Uh... It would be cool though. Someday, someday. Also, I need something that I can haul back and forth across the, the world. So, probably. sure that. Whenever they make a small version of that, okay. They really do. They make a small version of that. Oh, actually, well, there you go. okay. They do. Sounds good. Uh, sorry about that, folks. We are back. <laughs> Clearly, a bit of a technical difficulty, but Mrs. Tomato is a phenomenal podcast editor, so that'll all be clipped out, and we'll go right back to where I was. Um, so the Polaris is out and mm. it's a big deal. People have been waiting for it for a long time. I think 2015 it was introduced and it is kind of like the first real capital ship in the game, although we're not getting engineering yet. So that's a little awkward. But um, have you been excited for this ship? What's the general reception of it so far? I've been uh, I've been excited for the ship only because it's like a really cool big ship. And I did actually buy one because I'm stupid. Uh, and spend too much money on internet spaceships. But, you know, I, I try to justify it by being a content creator for it. So, you know, it all kind of works out. Probably not. What? No, let's talk about it later. We'll talk about it later. Anyway. <laughs> it was a while ago, so it doesn't, it's fine. Our finances are fine. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> are you getting questions from off camera? <laughs> yeah. She's just looking, she's looking, she's staring at me. She's like, what did you, what did you spend money on? See, we're like, you just... We just bought a house. We're buying furniture. She did the budgeting for the furniture today. She showed them to me. I was like, okay, yeah, like that's pretty much what I figured. But it's all. <laughs> and then he's over here on the podcast, like, yeah, I just, <laughs> I just sold our uh, our second car and got a Let's got see. a Polaris. Uh, uh, sofa or internet spaceship? <laughs> I mean, you can go more places in the spaceship. Sofa sits right, still. Right, and I, I can't fly around a sofa. So, <laughs> exactly, I mean, dude. sorry, sweetheart. You're like, you're physically <laughs> sitting in the spaceship. Who needs a sofa? Like, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I, I mean, I can only fit like three friends on my sofa, but I could fit like 30 or 40 on the Polaris. So, you know, you it's, go. I feel like I got, I got, I got my money's worth. And you can basically. put a lot of sofas on the Polaris too. So there you can put a lot of sofas and there are sofas in the game them. now. Yeah. Legitimately. Guys. Okay. So we've, we've just made it completely clear where you should be spending your money. Clearly, the um, <laughs> priorities. This is going to be the. Uh, this is, we're, we're starting a new financial uh, podcast here, me and Tomato. So it's our first one. We're going to be telling you guys, you know, how to how to properly finance in your life. You know, save money, invest. The, the, the idea is to buy lots of star citizenships. Okay, no, seriously. Anyway, um, star citizen, the Polaris. I really like it. I think it was really well done. The exterior is phenomenal, highly detailed. Most detailed ship I think we've ever gotten, uh, certainly in players' hands, but I think just generally speaking, in, in, we've ever seen in Star Citizen. Um, I would say it, it feels more even detailed than the Bengal. I think like the, the amount of details on it really sells its scale, but I think it's also because it's a relatively new ship compared to the Bengal... Uh, and the old version of the Javelin and the Idris. By the way, they've updated those to be up to like a higher standard if you saw the Squadron 42 trailer. So they're probably now more in line with the Polaris looks like. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it looks phenomenal inside so much. It's, it's, it's capital ship. So there's a huge amount of space on the interior. Um, there's honestly so much to talk about for it. It's going to take 30 minutes to make an architect reviews for it. And I'm excited oh my to do gosh, so. It's going to be such like covering these larger uh, ships. I've been like toying with the idea of doing ship videos and I'm like, but all these ships are going to get so big. I can understand yeah. covering a ship with a cockpit and a couple of rooms. That's easy to, to go through, but that's a lot. This yep. is like a whole FPS level flying around. It is. And, uh, you know, I, I think that it, it was definitely designed in the interior to be that way, to, to with the idea that you could you'd you'd have battles in it. So there's been there's a lot of really 
Uh, there's a lot of good thought process that went into the floor plan to allow multiple different routes. So there's not a lot of uh, single bottlenecks, which I think a lot of other older CIG ships kind of suffer from. So I think it'll be a fun ship to board, a fun ship to have uh, missions on. I'm guessing they're probably, uh, if, if, if you're not planning to, they definitely should use this as like a, another 890 jump type mission where you have to board and clear borders or something. You know, you can imagine something like that happening. It'd be very yeah. exciting. That's one of the most fun things about the idea of these larger ships coming into the game is how much they can use them in the game itself as set pieces, as objectives, as like little, just, you know, like the 890 jump boarding mission. One of the things that I've always loved or not loved, but noticed in games that I would play elsewhere were they weren't quite as ambitious as Star Citizen is like you go and you'd run this mission within the game and that that mission would send you to some video or sorry some vehicle or some building or somewhere where you wanted to like spend more time and observe and explore and it's cool to be able to run a mission within a capital ship and be like wow this is really cool but we got to go continue our mission and then two hours later be like hey you know what let's just go back and and take one of those ships out and explore it for ourselves it's not just a set piece that comes and goes in the game this is something you can actually see and spend time in and uh, get to experience more than just whatever they set up in the storyline. Yeah. That's, I, that's what definitely makes... I mean, gameplay is the most exciting thing for me nowadays, not ships. Those ships are... I mean, like, it, it's so... Uh, it's such an easy thing to be excited for, but it, it doesn't last very long because at some point after you, like, tour the whole ship, you're like, all right, now what do I do with it? So yeah. um, ships have kind of lost a little bit of their excitement for me in recent years, but I'm still, like, really excited every time a new ship comes out. You know, it's going to have... It's going to be something for me to explore and talk about at the very least. Yeah, um, it's, it's not... There's not quite the same ring to it as uh, when you say architect reviews, cargo loading. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Now reactions to it have been uh really positive there's a lot of people posting and like reddit's just all players posts and twitter's all players yeah, posts like every it's completely overshadowed the the star lancer which also came out in the ptu patch by the way um right yes yeah, sorry star lancer we meant to put you yeah. in the title but you know <laughs> only so nobody many like uh, it completely overshadowed them i mean it it's a really great ship too, by the way. A lot of great detailing in the Star Lancer really elevates, I think, the Misk brand and the uh, the the gold standard for what Misk ships should look like on the interior. Although they did copy paste the hull C interior uh, for the kitchen, which annoys me because there was one pipe that I pointed out that I didn't like, and they did it again. So I will definitely be pointing. I will rant about that for a moment, just for the in the video that I'll make. But no, it's it's Come it's on, an excellent CIG. ship. Where's your pipe? Um, game? I got to meet uh, actually the concept That's artist good. who had done that, uh, which was really uh, was really fun to uh, to talk to him and some of the other ship team guys from CIG. Uh, the the concept artist who who worked on it was Alberto, but it was a it's obviously a huge team that uh, that makes this stuff happen. So there's there's, there's a long process with lots of different people who who make it you know come to come to reality. So I'm, it's not just him, but it, it's really really fantastic ship. Anyway. Um, funny thing is about the Polaris, I see a lot of posts about <laughs> the mirrors, strangely enough, inside the Polaris. Uh, what? Yeah, there's like a there's a there's a bunch of people posting about it for some reason. I don't know why people the mirrors think that. like yeah, there's, there's like there's mirrors. mirrors. Yeah, no, that they, they actually like show people in the mirrors, oh, but they actually work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that would be the first I'm, time I'm I think just... mirrors worked in the game. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna leave it at that. I think it's a funny thing that they people pointed that out on uh, on Reddit over like just how cool the exterior looks. It's like that, that's the thing that I'm most excited for. Is like it's <laughs> wonder, freaking cool looking. I wonder if they're using like rendered a texture for that. I think I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and then uh, you know the interior looks fantastic. I, I guess the the one thing that really stuck out to me most about it though is that the first post on Reddit and it just kind of confirms my thought on big ships now in Star Citizen is that they're no longer rare. Like these big capital ships when we started covering Star Citizen started backing Star Citizen so long ago, it seemed like these were going to be rare things that you would see and you'd be like, "Well, that's so cool." But my feeling is now that everybody has these ships. So when the Polaris actually releases, I feel like 
everybody's going to be running box missions with them. You're going to find them at every outpost, at every space station, like at every encounter, there's going to be Polaris flying around. Yeah, but that's how it's it always is. Ridiculous. Every time yeah, any no, ship comes out, it's like that's the only ship that exists for a well, lot of people for a while. T- tomato, listen to yourself. We're talking about like, what, an $800 ship. That's it's t- true. Yeah. And whatever but, it's going to be now that it's released, it's probably going to be more than that. I'm guessing it's going to be close to a thousand or more. But this is like one of the most, like it's an $800 ship. That's on its own. Ridiculous. Okay. That, that doesn't, I don't think many people would balk at the idea of an $800 digital ship, especially one that was not released for nine years. This thing, yeah. <laughs> this thing was shown for the first time in 2015. Um, and that's that's nuts to me. And I think that's part of why people are so excited for it to come out. It's like there are not very many ships that are this large, this immediately useful in a game like Star Citizen, which is still lacking a lot of larger industrial and science based gameplay and has been around for this long. Like the Idris is is within that list, the Idris, the Javelin, um, the Polaris. I don't even I don't know if there are any other ships that fit on that list. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of the few that are that big that are gonna that's gonna come out anytime soon. So yeah, and uh, I think it's pretty special. Yeah, it, it makes sense, but at the same time, <laughs> it is gonna be interesting how much it's flying around, and it coming with engineering was sort of the the stopgap there. It's like, oh, okay, well, the capital ship's finally coming in. It clearly makes sense because like their capital style gameplay is starting to filter in. But now yeah. we're not even going to see engineering come in anytime soon. It's, it'll be interesting to see how the Polaris plays before and after engineering for people. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely going to be interesting. I fear that there's not much... I mean, the, the, when, when CIG said before that they weren't pushing for getting um, capital ships in because there wasn't gameplay associated with it, I don't think that that's really changed. So once this comes in with or without the engineering gameplay... Uh, I, I'm challenged to really think of what you're going to realistically use it for. I mean, people hardly fly hammerheads around unless they just want to do something that looks cool, right? So definitely people fly around for looking co- looking cool in it, but there's not something that you necessarily need it for right now, unless it's an event where you're taking out cap ships, right? I, I But those are not happening all the time. So, yeah, I don't know. It's... Uh, it's an interesting one. I, I'm, I'm thinking that we still need some, we, we still need some time before cap ships are going to make sense in Star Citizen. But for now, we'll we'll have really big cool ships to fly around in and have fun with it. I mean, yeah, more regular boarding style gameplay, more missions that yeah. take advantage of larger combat situations. Definitely, mm-hmm. definitely more reasons to wait for something like that or to make a, a ship like this more useful in the long run. I, it's interesting because I think this ship most effectively right now will be like area denial. This is a really easy way for you to be like, hey, we're running something for the org. Um, we need to make sure people aren't coming by. Just park a Polaris nearby. And for a lot of people, that would be enough to not fly near. It's just area deterrence doesn't really pay. <laughs> so you're not like running missions and making money with the ship. You're just using it for, like you said, sandbox or org stuff and accepting the fact that you're going to have to pay for that fuel or you might have to pay for the the ammo when you're not actually making much money from it or you just let it explode and reclaim it which is basically (laughs) what i think everyone's going to do for the foreseeable future with it i I think what's the claim time going to be on that though it's going to be huge i'm not sure what it is but i think it might be worth it versus paying for what the 28 size 10 torpedoes i mean size 8 torps to refill a a retaliator with just six of those is insanely expensive i forget the price but it was ridiculous polaris is going to be an arm and a leg to rearm it every time you use it so yeah i think people are just going to do insurance fraud for that thing for the foreseeable future (laughs) Yeah, it looks like Walgrid and Chad is saying that it's an hour fifteen minutes claim right now. Yeah, and I mean, that'll I, be man, that'll be days and days when they get to the final figures. Probably needs to be it to to make it make sense. Yeah, because like, how long would it take to craft something like this? That's really they're trying to scale it off of that. Um, 
but I think you brought up a good point. I, I think you're right. And once when they have like jump towns and stuff, it'll it's got four med beds in it that you can set spawn to. So Home I feel base. like it's going to be a good mobile base that's better than the 890 jump or the Carrick because it's you know it's it's an actual military ship with good turrets on it that can defend itself in both most directions. There is a bit of a blind spot behind the ship where there's no turrets uh, facing the rear, but. Mm. yeah we'll see if that really becomes a big deal or not in actual combat i suspect most big ships right now just kind of flail in combat anyway and there's no yeah. hope but we'll, we'll see it's this these capital ships i think are going to be a huge eye-opener to to folks as they start to develop of just how much of star citizen isn't actually in the game yet like there's just so much that's supposed to surround capital ship combat and the balance between fighters and large ships and the mm -hmm. risk of taking them out even like the insurance claim time we don't know when that's going to be put in the game but that changes everything when you gotta wait multiple days to get the ship back versus just blowing it up and and claiming it while you're offline for a couple hours or or pay money because you don't have a, a warranty on it it's a uh, it's gonna this is gonna be a big interesting change to the game over time but initially yeah. it feels like right now there's not much to it. Yep. No, it's going to be like a, a 990 jump with more guns on it, basically. Any particularly interesting things like this, the power of the torpedoes, the amount of turrets inside, like anything that really jumped out to you that really sets it apart from other ships. Mm, I think it's got the most, it's got the biggest, uh, hanger on it. The, of any ship we can fly in game right now so that's kind of a cool thing and you can actually fit a pisces on the in the in the lower lower uh cargo deck too a couple oh, wow. pisces and you, fit, you can fit actually a bunch of furies down there too so it's, i think it's a a fun pocket carrier that you can actually use as a pocket carrier so i i, I think it, it'll be fun to do but again like capital ships aren't really that useful in reality it's, you would only do that for the rule of cool like to have fun and do something cool with it but not because it would necessarily give you an advantage over just everybody flying a gladius uh so still i mean that i think it'll be fun for some time to fly around with people and i think the med beds are probably one of the coolest things four in there four is 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 great uh one of the problems we've had with both the carrick and with the uh uh with the 890 jump in doing orc stuff is that when a lot of people die you know be, there, there's a line to respawn and right. it slows down people getting back into the fight so now that there's four i think that'll actually speed things up quite a lot and make it a much better ship for those types yeah. of uh, sandbox org events yeah this hopefully, seems to become sorry go ahead no no was gonna, hopefully when the servers are running a little bit better post server meshing so it seems to be fitting into the spot as the go-to org base right now yeah at least. for now i think it'll be the go-to mobile org base for now cool looking forward to it gii Me too. we're gonna be we're gonna be testing this out actually right after this recording so well before you guys hear this when it's published but um we'll be putting this thing through through its paces i think over the next couple of weeks oh by the way there's a functioning brig on the ship which is really funny so you can put <laughs> people in there and lock them in there and there's no way for them to get out unless they backspace so that's kind of funny gonna be good for rp there's also a little uh really cool design in there i'll let you discover it for yourself for how that works well, the whole brig area is really so cool there's like i think anybody who was going over the video during citizen con where they toured the interior was feeling this there's just so much space in that ship there are there's a brig there's a mess hall slash meeting area there's the cockpit there's the, the missile space there's a massive engineering bay looks like one of the most impressive engineering bays we've seen in the game so far and i think a lot of players would wonder outside of rp how much of that is actually going to be useful for the people who are using this ship from from what you've seen obviously i don't think anybody really knows but they've built these ships with the intention that you would realistically need to use all of that ship do you think that's gonna truly be fulfilled i think only for events for right now I think realistically, you're only really going to use all of this ship for. Let, let's say Star Citizen 1.0, uh, though. Like where they're headed. Oh, for 1.0. Oh, you mean for where they're headed? Blue sky, yeah. future yeah. stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it'll, it'll be useful. I mean, I hope, based on what they're planning to do to make big ships as you know, a bigger part of the game with like uh, instance fleet battles and such, 
it seems to me that bigger ships are going to have a place. My goal, or my, my hope at least, is for them to find a way to slot in all ship sizes uh, for combat and, and make them all make sense in different situations and not have a single light fighter meta like we've always had. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it, it remains to be seen whether or not they're, or when they're going to pull it off. I do have confidence that they eventually will pull off uh, a balance that will enable ships other than light fighters to, to participate. Um, but for now it's, it's not gotten to that point, but yeah, eventually I, I, I think it will get to the point where these, sh these types of ships will be useful and we'll have a place in, in fleet combat, especially, you know, when server meshing is a thing and we have space stations and bases to defend and such for, you know, orgs that really want to stake a claim out there and to in lawless space and own and own parts of planets for resources and such. I mean, these will be great ships to hold a point, to defend against other fleets. I feel like. I really we'll look forward to, to that. Yeah. yeah, I hope yeah. I hope that does work out because that's an exciting idea. The idea of spending like a lot of time on a capital ship and needing to figure out how you spend that time and how the org splits that time up and uses their resources and stuff is uh, part of the part of a game that I've never really thought about. One of those things that really attracted me to Star Citizen. The rest of our talk. I, go ahead. And well, I think it remains to be seen, though, whether or not people would actually like to spend time on somebody else's ship for a long period of time to set it as their respawn, the place that they start the game in. I I'm not sure how that's going to work, whether or not people are going to enjoy doing that. Um, it seems to me that most people want to be the captain of their own spaceship. A lot of so people, a lot of people do want to be crew. Like at least half their time, I ran a couple of polls and a lot of people were like, yeah, I want to fly my own ship, but like half the time I'm playing, I'd like to be crew. And I think that that view is fairly low right now because there's so much less work. Like you can't be an engineer, you can't be a medic, you can't be a scanning officer or a navigations officer or whatever. Everybody, all we know is combat, box deliveries, mining, salvage, and flying. And all of those yeah. things require flying because you can't get a ride anywhere. There's no localized gameplay, so you can't do anything on the ground. I think as we start getting more and more diverse, diversity in the game, less people will be obsessed with kind of flying their ships all the time. And I don't know about people spending days on, at, at a time on somebody else's crew. Like maybe you need to diversify that gameplay a little bit. But I do think that there maybe, are... You know there's there are games like um i used to play a lot of space engineers where everybody would be working on one ship but because you built the ship so you, mm -hmm. you'd have to I mean that that's how the game works it's a building game but if if the game has stuff like um has repairs and maintenance and there's uh you know crafting gameplay and such and these big ships become somewhat of a, a burden to take on by yourself. And it really requires an org effort in order to maintain and operate. I could see it becoming an ongoing effort to, to take care of these ships and, and to make them make sense. So, you know, th there could be a scenario where there is a reason why you want to stick around because you're constantly, you, you have tasks, you have loops to, to keep you engaged. If that's the type of gameplay you like, you're, a starship mechanic and you are really enjoying the activity of repairing and maintaining and crafting and finding resources and going and mining those resources, maybe finding, you know, upgraded uh, components, making upgraded components to swap out into the, you know, the, the org players to make it even better than it was before. So when people log back on, you can tell them, Hey, look guys, I upgraded these turrets. I upgraded these systems. It's so much better than it was before. I, I can see that as a possibility of happening. Because I've seen it happen in games like Space Engineers, so yeah, satisfactory well, that happens all the time. Yeah, yeah, satisfactory is another I think great example. It's a super super complex system game, uh, and I don't think CIG will ever make it that complex. But it's no. a great I think precedent study for them to look at for how to make systems and loops uh, interesting and engaging over long periods of time. Yeah, it all really depends on how entertaining it'll be to not be flying a ship and i think that's one of the strengths that star citizen has versus its competitors is it spent so much time focusing on that first person perspective that they're now forced to make good first person gameplay compared to a game that might have like all of their focus on on starships and spaceships and flying around so you can focus more on how combat is going in the spaceships and how the exploration or upgrade cycle goes um 
Star Citizen just has more it has to focus on and convince people of. And I think being a crew on a ship is pretty, pretty high on that list to, to get right. Yeah. But the rest, yeah. the rest of our talk is kind of focusing more on that angle, which is the design and depth of Star Citizen that not only attracts a lot of people to it, Granted, it's, it's quite broken, so like it's not necessarily the most fun, <laughs> fun environment for most people right now, but it gets a strong comparison to what I have surmised to be one of the most beloved MMOs of all time. And it's not like a super popular like WoW or Final Fantasy XIV or any of like the big ones that have stuck around for multiple decades, but I do think that this game, I'd actually be interested in knowing why it died because it seems like it had the, the excitement to stick around for decades. And people are constantly saying that like Star Citizen feels kind of like a spiritual successor to Star Wars Galaxies. So to kick off this part of the talk and this topic, I guess I would like to just hear from you and anybody else who has never played or heard of the game. What is it, like what is Star Wars Galaxies? What makes it a unique MMO that set it apart from others? Sure. Um, Star Wars Galaxies remains to this day to be one of the most complex MMOs ever to have actually been made and run for a duration of time. Uh, and it, it, it has such a strong following that even today people are running emulators of it since Sony Online Entertainment SOE shut down the servers, I think over 10, 15, 15 years ago now, like it's been a long time since they shut the service down, but there's still such a strong following for it because the game was so in depth and interesting. It was really ahead of its time. Now, just to go back, Star Wars Galaxies, as you may surmise, you may have guessed, is Star Wars Universe. This is the Star Wars Universe uh, in, a, in an MMO. And uh, it focused on a series of planets within the inner and outer rims. Um, they weren't fully realized planets. This is a long time ago. When did when did it come out? Star Wars Galaxy is like early two thousands is yeah, when it released. So you got it. Two thousand three. Yeah. So this was pre even. This was before people even conceived of the possibility of fully modeling and realizing a sphere with gravity in a game world. So they they had to cut a lot of corners to make that happen, but they did it in a way that just felt believable uh enough like it kept you immersed it had that verisimilitude uh where you never felt like you were um being pulled out of the experience because of uh some gameplay system for the time um so they had a bunch of different planets you could visit they were big open plant uh areas that you could explore uh and find like you know hidden things dungeons and uh you do combat against npcs or players they had uh, a territory-based system. You could choose to be rebels, neutral, or imperials. You could actually play as the imperials. And there were tech trees on both sides to develop uh, and to pursue as progression to like get armor and upgrades and stuff and, and rare weapons. It was very cool in that way. Um, but what made it really extra special uh, wasn't just that they had multiple planets um, that uh, had these big open play spaces, but that they it had like 32 basic professions and like a couple more secret professions like Jedi that you had to do a couple things in order to get and achieve that they didn't ever tell you exactly how to do. So mm -hmm. there was always this mystery surrounding it that would drive people to, you know, try to figure out what the right combination was, was uh, to, to get to achieve uh, cool. being a Jedi. It was, it was a really cool idea, a really cool way of doing it. But these different, different professions played different roles. They had different combat abilities. Uh, some of them were crafters. There were architects. Um, you know, the, the architects would, okay, now I'm, th this is the cool part. The even cooler part of it is that these professions would, um, connect with base building, uh, with player housing, with, uh, decorations uh, with player equipment um players would be able to uh create weapons create armor and they would have different qualities based on the manufacturing process of the player and the like the process the combination the way that they made these things back at that time would be highly coveted and there would be certain individuals who had figured out a system uh that worked really well they wouldn't share with anybody but you would know you would have to go to that person to say get the best uh, Eleven Blaster, like um, the uh, the Pope was the was a guy that I that was on my server back when I played, and that's the guy you went to to get really good blasters. I recall it just created this that's really cool. cool player run economy based on 
different like different types of gameplay so that everybody kind of had something for them in the game if you weren't really into combat you could do crafting you could make weapons or armor and support people that way uh, and i haven't even touched on the space combat so back in the early 2000s there was a video game where you could fly with friends in a multi-crew ship in space that's what star, star wars galaxies let you do that so you could hop into the millennium falcon uh yt-1300 and you could man the top and bottom turrets with your friends you could fly as they man the top and the bottom and you could look out the windows as other people flew their ships around and and shot at you or yeah that's NPCs. pretty crazy that they figured that out in 2003 that's nuts it was because that was a novel was experience in star citizen in 2018 there, there was a lot of technical limitations to the way they could do it back then. So, uh, you know, like don't, it wasn't a fully connected world where you fly, you would fly seamlessly from planet surface to, to space. So could, like that tech is still super new. Not a lot of games were able to do that, but they mm -hmm. were able to pull it off where it would still felt like immersive. Uh, I remember having a Sora sub, uh, Sora sub luxury yacht and I decorated the interior. Like you could place couches and, and like, the, the various things you looted around the world, the rare armors, and you could place them around your spaces and create this kind of like bourgeois of, of, of your accomplishments to take friends through and show off like what you've done in the past. That was always a really fun thing to do. But you could get really complex with it. You like people would build um, player cities and in the player cities, they would have uh, cantinas and bazaars that they would sell the wares of their, you know, organization in where you could go go in there and, and buy stuff from the org to support it. And it was just, would, it was such a, sorry, go ahead. Would those cities be like owned by the org? Would those, are these just random cities that already spawned up or players completely no, no, started no. them and could run them from ground up? So there was a, you could become a mayor and establish your own city and you would get assigned a plot of land and then you could basically assign where players could build their houses within your city. Uh, you would have to give them permission permission to do that. You could uh, design like squares, like uh, public squares and, and public spaces. You could put in bazaars, or, like a town hall, a bazaar and stuff where people could put up their shops. It was really in depth, actually. That it was is, very, very cool. It's very cool. My big question on that system then would be what what incentivizes the players to come and join each of those cities? Well, um, well, the, the community thing, I think, was the would have been the the biggest thing for why you'd want to join a city with somebody Just else you could of course just, you can make your own outpost somewhere uh if you wanted to um it could have also you know i didn't i didn't ever establish my own player city though i only was i only was participating in other player other um bigger you know clan cities myself like i never ran one myself uh, and did you so, just go just to be there just to be around yeah, other yeah, people. Yeah, I wanted to, I, I wanted to be there with the rest of my, you know, my big organization with all the people in it. So like, okay. you know, build my house next to a bunch of other friends and, and kind of be in that community. I know, but there was also resource extraction though. And you'd want to be able, I think you wouldn't be able to build in an area unless you got permission. So you might've built it over resources that you'd want to, you'd want to use. So they, there were things like resource extractors and crafting uh, buildings that you would build and such. Uh, again, back in the early 2000s, it's pretty wild that they they yeah. had done all of these things back then. But all of these things, you know, they work together in Star Wars Galaxies to make this player driven uh, economy, not to the extreme of EVE Online, where it could be completely upended by a single bad actor. Uh, but, it, you know, enough player driven that was really fun. It just struck such a great balance. It wasn't a perfect game by any means. There were certainly flaws with the later state of the game um, and the way that you know, some people at the company decided to go in order to try to compete with WoW, which had become really popular after it had released. So they were trying to copy trends from that, and it kind of messed up the game a little bit. But that aside, there was a lot of good with the game, a lot of success with the game systems. I mean, it's a, it's 20 years past its release, and people still refer to it almost on the daily for things that they miss from MMOs. And I think it really says something that this game from the early 21st century nailed so much of what people wanted in an MMO that hasn't come together in another game since then, from, from what I'm hearing. Um, that's, I mean, you would think, 
You got a great MMO people love with the Star Wars franchise. Look at the technology we have today. This seems like a no-brainer to make. Um, and they made The Old Republic, which, you know, from what I've heard, has found its success. But it's kind of crazy to see that nobody's really taken the shot at what Star Wars Galaxies was. And it sounds like that generally is because of similar things to Star Citizen, which is there's a lot of thought and work that has to go into building out all these systems and make them work together on top of MO network difficulties and development problems. And it doesn't yeah. seem like companies really want to make gigantic MMOs anymore because they're so expensive. Yeah, and, and EVE Online... Sorry, not EVE. <laughs> Star Wars Galaxies was a... I would assume it would have been a very expensive game to build. Uh, there were so many different systems, and it definitely wouldn't have fit into what we would consider today a typical development cycle of around two years, which is the expectation from investors and, and you know, corporate. They, it's ultimately a money-making endeavor. You know, we as gamers want to play a fun game, but they as the, the higher-ups of those companies, they just want to make money. So it doesn't make sense to develop a game like that anymore because it's it was so complex back then. But you look at what they did looking you know i'm looking back with rose tinted glasses looking at all these systems and they were so amazing for the time but if you if you put them up against today's standards obviously none of it holds up anymore the the graphics don't look good anymore they're clearly very dated um you know none of the models look particularly exciting you know there was no voiceovers really for any of the npc interactions but for the time that was not really an expectation to have voice actors as part of your game, your MMO was going well above the norm. It was not something that was commonly done. Most of it was text. You would be reading text and answering yes or no and going through things. Now expectations have become everything's mo capped. Everybody's in everything's acted highly detailed models. Everything's physicalized. So to try to like make a game like Star Wars Galaxies, even if you copy pasted all of those systems, but then to update everything else to be visually updated, it would be it basically be like another Star Citizen. It would be nobody would be able to fund the, the making that game. It would take forever and it wouldn't make any money, at least initially. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, that's it's a lot to invest initially. You mentioned that a lot of what did this game in was its kind of trend ch chasing. Um following what yeah, was I mean, making other MMOs popular. What what kind of things set Star Wars Galaxies, for context mainly for people listening, what kind of things set this game apart so much from a very popular game like World of Warcraft or more traditional MMOs? So I think why a lot of people ended up, and, and this, is, this is obviously anecdotal because I don't know, I don't think anybody really knows what exact, was the exact cause. We know when things started to go downward but it didn't die immediately uh there was a lot of things that caused the game to slowly die off uh, and there was a moment near the end where things started to improve a lot because the developers started to kind of you know get into a groove and figure out how to make things work but by that time things have had already gone too far downhill they had lost so much of the initial fan base that they had started with that they were just fighting an uphill battle all the way till the server shut down. Um, so to go back to it, um, what made it so exciting, I think initially was all of those different professions that they had and the, and the mystery of how to achieve Jedi and some of the other professions and uh, the mystery of how to get some of the best equipment. There was, there was a lot of really great game making with the original version of it. Uh, and because it had so many things you could be and do that it didn't, you know, it didn't peg you into one specific type of gameplay. There was a little bit of everything in there for people. You didn't have to choose, say, one profession. You could choose three professions. You could choose a, a set of ones that you enjoyed uh, and then create another character if if you wanted to really try something very different. So it, it was a really flexible experience that really did work for a lot of people. So long, of course, that as you liked the Star Wars setting. Um, personally, when I started, I didn't, I didn't even like star wars i didn't know much about star wars it's what got <laughs> me into star wars star wars galaxies was my gateway drug to the star wars fandom so what what really started to make it fall apart was the combat uh the combat upgrade and then the um that was kind of a little bit of the start but the really big uh the really big change that they made was the um 
new game enhancements. And what that did was they basically cut all of those professions and they cut them down to just eight. And then you would choose those from the very beginning. And you, that, that's what you would be for, for your character. So instead of like working all these professions and then choosing to be a bounty hunter, that elite profession afterward, because you would choose some basic ones, you mm-hmm. know, carboneer marksman and stuff. There were some basic uh, ability professions that you would master. And then you would be able to become a bounty hunter or a Jedi or like some of these higher level um, professions. Now, in the end, you could just be that high level profession. That's what they changed it to. So a lot of people felt that they had worked so long, so many years to achieve this like high level title and this ability and this equipment only for them to literally overnight make it so that, you know, average Joe just joining in now could basically get what you had from day one. And it was really deflating for a lot of people. It took away, it, it took the wind out of a lot of people's sails. It felt like a, a, a sucker punch by the developers. And the reason why they did it was because wow had become so wildly successful. Now, you know, everybody, like I said, has got their own opinions for why it happened. And in, in the comment section of this very video, you'll have, you know, 10 different explanations for it. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, you know, they wanted, they, they thought that copying somebody else would, copying them would, would make it more successful. But in my mind, copying WoW doesn't make a lot of sense because if people wanted to play wow they just play wow they wouldn't right. play a cheap copy of wow with star wars flavor so i think that they they instead should have tried to continue to develop and hone their own version of an mmo even if it was more niche than wow see wow had i think bigger appeal a fantasy setting was more i think wildly widely appealing than a star wars setting at the time star mm-hmm. wars fandom is huge now but you know like it's become a lot bigger as the years have gone on, it's, it was not this big in the past. So they didn't have that immediate easy following to, to get in the, in the gaming world for the star Wars MMO, that star Wars MMO, star Wars galaxies. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's unfortunate. And then after that, you know, things just went a bit downhill and they started to figure out the combat, uh, system a little bit better and, and things became a bit more balanced in the end, but initially, it was a bit, it really was hard <laughs> to deal there's, with. There's something to be said about sticking to your foundation. I know Star Citizen goes through a lot of cycles of like, hey, they're adding this. This is kind of dumb. You know, this isn't like real life. This is too much like real life. They shouldn't be doing this. And there's got to be a lot of challenge in trying to decide, is this really right for our game or not? Yeah, it might be something people love. Um, but is it, are we only adding it because another game did it and it, and it works well? Are we yeah. avoiding this specifically because other games avoid this? Should we not do this because the rest of the game industry doesn't do this? Like how much, how much of that sort of typical knowledge should go into the design of your game when you're trying to make something that is going to stand on its own? Yeah. I mean, I think where things in my mind really fall apart is when you start compromising on your, uh, your, your principles, you start, pulling back from that initial dream that you were selling to people that made people invested in your, in your game. I think when you start doing that, you start, you start losing people, but then when you betray people's trust, it's hard to get that trust back. I mean, CIG has not done anything near as bad as what SOE did to their player base with when they changed the, the profession system and, and cut the legs out from so many people. I think that that is a, is a is a great example of what not to do. So I think the lesson is to like stick to your principles and don't abandon the people who made your game what it is today for the promise of maybe you'll be able to find more people later. Uh, I don't think that is a realistic approach and that it would work well. Maybe it sounds good in a boardroom, but in reality, it clearly didn't work for SOE. I'm not, again, saying that this is what CIG is going to do. I'm just hoping that CIG looks at it as as a great example to stick to their guns for their vision and have these big ideas. And by having those big ideas, I think people will continue to support them, you know, as long as they continue to deliver on promises incrementally. That's a a big debate that's been in CIG or in Star Citizen. I think since some of the more important design choices have been coming along, 
Um, mm-hmm. This is something I think most recently was made obvious. There's one topic that I know is floating in everyone's minds when it comes to this subject, but one I think that recently has come up that is very obvious is physicalized cargo and how it's moved around. Um, there are a lot of approaches to this. Some would say, hey, this is how they've always wanted to do it, so they should do it. Others would say, just because they always wanted to do it doesn't make it right. The The game industry has moved on. Um, and then they have that decision to make with other things like death, like respawning, bed spawning, um, the flight model, sliding when, when sprinting, just all kinds of things that are kind of getting brought in because a game needs to become a game. And I wonder if you feel like they are in any way in that area of changing things to attract more people of starting to sacrifice some of that older vision in order to broaden the audience that might be interested in this game. What are your thoughts? on I that? think, I think one of the problems, okay. So in a game's development, your initial vision for a game isn't necessarily the vision that you deliver. Uh, I think that it's natural for a game from concept to delivery is going to change and adapt to the times and the current expectations. It's only natural if you want to uh, make a game that people will play and um, will make it's it, It's only right if you want to make a game that will meet people's expectations, because there are certain things that happen in gaming that just become the norm because that's the better way to do it. Not because it's a fad, but because we figured out that that is probably the more engaging way to make a game uh, when you're making it in that. Okay. Let me give you an example. Sure. FPS, FPS games. Initially a long time ago when, when, F, when first person shooters first came out, you know, like doom, uh, you had a, you had a fixed gun in front of you. And for a lot of years going up to like counter strike, that's how it worked. You had a crosshair in the middle of your screen and you had the gun either on the center of the screen or off to the right, like being held in a fixed position. Mm-hmm. At some point, I think it was Call of Duty that did this. Uh, maybe I'm wrong in the first game to do this, but they introduced an aim down sights feature, which was a really immersive and innovative way of doing an FPS combat game. And from that point, basically every game now has an aim down sights feature. They've a, like that. A traditional Counter Strike look has been, it's kind of in the past now, um, to some extent. I think there's still some games that kind of go to that retro feeling. Um, there's, a, there's a more recent game that's, a, that's become really popular that's an offshoot of the Counter Strike uh, kind of archetype. My point is, my point is, is that when you, um, th- there's, there are certain things that are discovered in gaming that are just the way that seems right to do it. And I don't think it's wrong for CIG to get with the times, given they've been going for 12 years, and update their, uh, their way of making FPS combat. Like, if they had made a game back in 2012, expectations back then are completely different than what they are today. Back then, I don't think there was sliding. I, w- was there a game where you could slide around? I'm not sure. 2012? Maybe- uh, Call of Duty was probably doing it Call- around there. If not yeah, sliding, maybe, maybe at, Call- least, at least diving. What, what did- when did Modern Warfare 2 come out? That was 20, um, 2007. The original one. Modern Warfare 2, um, yeah, 2007, 2008. Okay, so then sliding, sliding was actually still uh, w- w- was something. But Call of Duty was kind of pioneered that kind of movement mechanic. That was for, the golden age of COD, man. That was good times. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they pioneered a lot of modern movement mechanics. I think that they kind of mastered that. And a lot of people now look at, is that, look at COD as a, uh, as a study for how to make engaging and interesting um fps combat hate it or love it yeah. i know milson players are not going to be super excited to hear me talking about hey, it man. but kill streaks it, it is... like all that kind of stuff came from from those games call of duty 4 call of duty 5 black ops they killed it right and i don't think and i'm not saying that star citizen is copying cod i think there's elements of arma there's elements of milsim in star citizen 2 it's it's trying to be its own character taking bits and pieces to fit within the vision of what they're trying to realize which is a more it's a stylized realistic look at space combat not an absolute realistic simulation but like a stylized pseudo realism style of sci-fi game right yeah um 
you know, there, there's, there's some, some science sci-fi movie stuff in there that I think that's really what it is. It's like, it's, it's why it's trying to be a sci-fi movie that you can, that you can play a game inside of, if that makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I don't think so. To go back to your original question, cause I've meandered a little bit, uh, is, is I, I think it's fine what they're doing. I've, I thought a lot of people like to accuse CIG of scope creep, but I don't think that that's what's happening. I think that they're just filling in the question marks that were uh, not ex well explained by simple one sentence stretch goals back in 2016, where it said one thing and you know, like you could take it in so many ways. They're, they're making sense of those stretch goals at this point. So, I've been saying this for years and I'm going to stick by it. I, I think it, it makes sense what they're doing. Okay. Do you think that with all the people who value this game in history and just kind of enjoyed what Star Wars Galaxies offered, many of those people don't know Star, Star Citizen exists right now. Even people yeah. who liked, you know, uh, Wing Commander or Freelancer don't know that it exists. You think that those people will be satisfied by Star Citizen? If it reaches always, its goals, I think there's always going to be. I can't speak for everybody in the community, but I, I, I could just, I just know that there's. You can't make everybody happy. Yeah. Again, I, I think if the one problem, the, the, the way to fail with almost certainty is for you to to deviate from a, from the vision you may have had from the onset. Like everybody working at CIG. I hope that they're all working on a singular vision for how to, to the direction you want them to go with the game. Like look at the recent star Wars movies. They had three different directors for the three different movies. And you can tell because the, you know, the second director didn't really follow what the first director was doing. And the third director just kind of did their own thing. You know, that's, I don't think the best way to do it. I think that that's why those movies weren't particularly successful is because it didn't have this overarching vision for all three movies. If if CIG is to succeed, for Star Citizen to succeed, I think that they need to stick to their guns for the vision that they have and try to make that work and try not to compromise on that vision. Because the more and more you compromise, the more you stray from that vision, I think the less, uh, less interesting it's going to be, the less engaging it's going to be. So... That that would be my that would be my point. Don't compromise too much. Sure, some things may need to have be curtailed. Some things you may find to be, you know, not they, they might not work in reality like the way you imagine. For example, the recent change to the physicalized inventory. Um, initially, there was this drawer system, as you recall, for accessing your inventory in your habs and around <laughs> landing zones. And a lot of people, including myself, made the comment that it added a lot of friction unnecessarily to the experience. It's not that the physicalization of inventory is not something we didn't want to see. It's just that the way that it was being done was, wasn't very engaging. It was I counterproductive think, to the experience. I think that point actually got lost because a lot of people used the complaints about the specific implementation to say, oh, this whole idea of physicalizing the inventory is, is a bad idea. And I am glad that CIG was still, you know, very clear in pointing out that we are sticking with what we're doing. We just realized that what you guys have a problem with this is a bit of a problem. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think that that's a thing that they did take away from it. I don't think they were taking away that the whole physicalization of it is yeah. not going to work because... <laughs> There's nobody doing a whole physicalized inventory system or, or cargo system. And, and the reason why they're doing it is because they clearly have this vision for enabling other kinds of gameplay. For example, the ability to, you know, physically sneak on board somebody's ship or to intercept somebody's ship and take that cargo physically off somebody's grid and put it on your other ship. Any other game in the past, it'd be like, click, explode, drop down menu, <laughs> drag, drop. You know, yeah. there, there's, there's a limiting quality to that. You certainly couldn't drag drop from somebody's inventory while they're still alive in a game like EVE Online. You need to blow them up first. Uh, it's not someone Star Citizen. If you can get that, if you can blow open the cargo door while that person is still flying around or not paying attention, you can steal their cargo. Or you could sneak on board, open the cargo doors, and chuck things out in, in Quantum and have your buddies go pick it up. You're like, you can do that because they physicalized that system. And I buy the vision. It makes for some really cool emergent gameplay for me that's what makes me excited about star citizen i think the moment you stop 
The moment you stop um, thinking big and having this big vision is the moment you're going to lose people. You know, that that's my my thought on star citizen i think that's why it survived for so long why people keep you know sinking so much money into it is because nobody else is committing to this really big and exciting vision for a sci-fi game nobody's pushing the envelope everybody's just iterating right now in the doesn't industry really have direct, everybody else doesn't really yeah. have direct competition it doesn't. And then the people who are competing with it aren't really competing. They're only doing one specific thing well because it fits within that typical two year, three, four year development cycle, right? So, no, I, again, to go back to the main thing is I, I think that what they're doing makes a lot of sense and uh, the stick with that vision. <laughs> And you think, do you think that Star Wars Galaxy's folks are going to flock to Star Citizen for that reason? For the similarities Absolutely. between them? I, I know a lot of people used to play Star Wars Galaxies that absolutely love the direction that CIG is going. And, you know, I believe that there's a number of people at CIG that have played Star Wars Galaxies. I wouldn't be surprised if Richard Tyrer himself was a player of Star Wars Galaxies. If I ever have a chance to personally speak with him, because I've not had a chance to, unfortunately. I'd like to ask him that, if he's Maybe. ever played Star Wars Galaxies, or if he knows somebody, or if he was inspired by galaxies because the vision for 1.0 for me really feels like a spiritual successor to star wars galaxies he would be a person to talk to for sure clearly he is making a lot of the very big decisions at this point for both squadron and star citizen and i'd love to know more of the details around that but i'd also love to know really that i think this is the the, the point of this whole conversation is star citizen 1.0 to you sounds like a star uh, star wars galaxies 2.0 for lack of a better term um a spiritual successor if you will and i've heard that from other people what do you think really drives that comparison for everybody well i think that they're they're hitting on a lot of the the really important elements of star wars galaxies a lot of different professions flexible ones and then actually it's better because you don't have there's not this hard-coded system that you select x profession and you can only learn those skills after selecting x profession star wars sorry uh, star citizen is much more open than that there's not skills that you learn you just learn how to use these systems so in some ways it's an improvement on that old-fashioned way of doing an mmo and i really and i really like that um but then i think the the vision for the end game of star citizen for multiplayer is very similar to what it was for star wars galaxies you've got your um, you've got your PvP area. So Star Wars Galaxies towards the end had actually really figured out the PvP scene quite well. Initially, they didn't. Like back when during the supposed golden age of Star Wars Galaxies, there's a lot of stuff that that was missing, uh, like a really in-depth faction warfare system. It wasn't really present then. Towards the end of the game, it was. They had whole areas that you would fight other players in, like whole like whole map areas. Did they and block it off? Did they have separate maps for PvE and PvP like people want? No, you walked onto that map. You could do PvE or PvP, but you would you could get killed anywhere there. Okay. Uh, so you couldn't is... just get randomly killed, though, if you were out in the middle of nowhere on a regular, like in a non-PvP zone. Although okay. if you were, if you did declare like a, a war on another org, you could be, uh, uh, you could be engaged. I believe if I'm not, if I'm remembering this correctly. So there, so, there were specific areas where you would have a guarantee of being safe you go into yeah yeah there were areas like cities that you wouldn't be able to be attacked in so in okay. some ways it is it, there was some more traditional elements to it uh but it certainly was pushing the envelope of 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 games at that time uh of what was possible and it, it was really exciting for you to be able to go in an area and not know what was going to happen where you're going to encounter friends or foes and what kind of combat were you going to get into so you know you'd go in there with a roving gang of friends and try to find a fight and get some good loot and stuff and get out alive. Uh, I think that Pyro and, and uh, Nyx are going to be that kind of PVP PVE zone, high risk, high reward. That's, I don't know. I'm really excited that they were classifying the, the type of, of security between the, the safe and unsafe areas yeah, to give different types of players uh, places to be. Um, but I think that the crafting system you know, a way to it gives players a way to support other players uh, when they're not maybe necessarily that into combat or that capable of combat or that interested in combat. 
So, you know, th- there's a bit of that too. I think it's going to bring in a lot of people and make them feel more, uh, more welcomed and, and more like they're making a difference. If maybe they don't, feel like they're the best pilot in the world. And that's fantastic. I really like that about it, but just the crafting system in general, I think uh, the fact that, you know, what what makes a good crafting system good is that it, it, there's some meaningful, uh, it's, it's not just like you put in X and you get Y out. There's like some kind of mini game to it, a skill to it so that you, you feel like you're playing a game. You're trying to figure out the best way to do something to produce a better result. Uh, and I think that's what's going to make it interesting the way that they've pitched it. And that's what Star Wars Galaxies did really well and why people were really into being crafters. Like, there were people who were just, their accounts, they were, they were only a crafter. They were only a shipwright. They were only um, an entertainer. Like, they really liked doing those professions because for them, what they were doing was rewarding because they were helping other people in a meaningful and impactful way. So I'm, I'm excited that, that that's the direction that they're going uh, with crafting. But then also the end game for um, taking territory, having bases, building homes and homesteads and uh, space stations. We never got space stations uh, that you could build in Star Wars Galaxies. So I, am, I like to imagine if they'd ever made a Star Wars Galaxies 2, eventually would have been able to do that. Alas, that never, never happened. So that feeling of really adding into the world in specific ways that don't feel geared towards what the game's trying to do like some games focus on combat some games focus on industrial work and mining some focus on exploration but the way that this game is trying to provide choice in in different through different means to have an impact on the world seems to be one of the the key factors that links this to star wars galaxies and what it allowed for yeah yeah and and that, that's a key i think that's a big key thing uh, but the, that end game of like taking territory and fighting over territory, having like a resource sink, uh, you know, that really worked well in galaxies. It kept people interested for a long period of time. And I think that that's another thing that really excites me about uh, the vision for 1.0 and why I think it's, uh, you know, a su- spiritual successor. Uh, and there's another aspect of why I think it's a spiritual successor. I think a lot of people would agree with you there. Um, When it comes to Star Citizen 1.0, what 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 do you see that looks wrong? That looks like it might be not as great for the game compared to some of the other things like the crafting system we've been looking at. Um, you know, thinking on it, it's tough to say. Hold on, uh. Let me pull up that diagram and refresh my memory on this. Nothing, the fact that nothing comes to mind in particular for the vision for 1.0, I think bodes well in my mind for the vision of it. I think the the thing that I really took away from it is that they finally have a clear vision that they've stated publicly. It's been a long time since we've had that clarity from CIG. They've said a lot of things yeah. through the years and those things have changed through the years too in sometimes confusing ways that have not been well clarified. Uh and it's been a bit of a frustration as somebody who covers it, certainly as somebody who's a backer, uh to understand what they're really going for. And it's also created a lot of unnecessary friction in the community because everybody has their own idea for what they think Star Citizen's going to be. Man, and the PvP they can discussion they they create these camps and shut other people down if they don't fit within the vision they think it's going to be. So it's it's nice that they put their foot down or their feet down and said this is our vision for the game. This is what we're going for because it kind of to some extent quiets that discussion. Spot but on. I I think more importantly, more importantly having this vision gives you a a driving goal a reason like a a, a, an end point that you're trying to get to and it just makes me much more confident in the project that this these systems have been thought out that the loops have been considered and concepted even if we're not entirely sure if they're going to uh work in the first iteration certainly it's going to require some iteration and 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 balancing to to get it right but at least i think that they they've got this idea and this concepting uh of it that is that is really good. And, you know, one of the things that really jumped out to me was uh, this diagram that I just posted in chat. And maybe you, you could pop it up on the podcast where people can watch it. But it was one of the slides that was in the 
presentation when Richard Tyre was talking about visualizing loops and the way that all of these different uh, different professions connected was just so intriguing and exactly what I wanted to see out of a vision for the game. Um, I, I think this is the exact type of thinking that I've been hoping to see because this is what I think makes a game a game is these loops, these interconnecting gameplay experiences that um, either connect you directly with the, the loop or connect you with other players who help complete that loop. So maybe you don't want to go and mine for resources to get that blueprint. That's fine. You can go find somebody in your org or somebody that you know that will go get that blueprint for you that you can pay them for. And you can maybe keep doing the thing that you like, like doing bounty hunting runs to make some more money, right? So it's just... um. I think that's what really I took away from it. Yeah, the, you know, maybe you could say there are certain things that they talked about in their vision for Star Citizen that's missing from this. I, I know that there's stuff that's missing from this, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think 1.0 is the end, that it's a compromise. To me, I, what I think they're trying to do, and maybe this is an optimistic look, and I'm just, you know, huffing copium hard on this, is that they're trying to establish a strong baseline loop for the game, an actual game to play from which to build everything off of. And from a marketing standpoint, from a gameplay standpoint, from a, from a longevity standpoint, I think this makes the most sense. The sooner that they can get a game with loops in it, I think the longer people are going to be willing to stick around and spend money on the project. I don't think this current state of development where just islands of features and content are continually delivered in tier zero or worse format where there's no connection whatsoever between them. That's what I mean by islands of content is not a long-term sustainable way of doing star citizen. And we're starting to see that I think in the funding, I don't think that's the only reason why it's not uh, doing so well this year and then the year before, but I think it's a con possible contributing factor to it. Um, yeah. I think the more gameplay they get in, the more, new players they're going to get in and the better funding is going to be. So the, it makes sense to get to this more limited 1.0 first and then do 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, right? The, the joke always goes that they release more ships because they want to make more money, but I genuinely believe that they make more money based on how the game plays, not how many ships they're releasing. We can see they were releasing yeah. way more ships per year back in 2018, 2019 than they do now, yet they're making a lot more money now because... I mean, the audience is bigger, obviously, but the game's better. Just better to play. Ships, big ships are like a stopgap measure that are for, if you really think about it, they're only for existing backers. Very, very few new players come in and buy a big ship for their first purchase. They're always $45 packages. And the most profitable year CIG ever had was uh, two years ago when you look at the numbers for new players versus... Uh, funding and there's a lot of new players and a lot of funding. It means that a lot of people spend small amounts of money. That I think is the key to success, you know, and those people were brought in. Why? Because that citizen con showed off so many exciting things about star citizen and gameplay that seemed like they were coming soon. They didn't come very soon, but we also, it seemed like it was coming soon. I think that was also the year that we got, that was two years ago, 2022. Might not have been the year we got better persistence, but there was a year when persistence got better and um, Invictus of that year brought in a lot of streamers and the game was just in general running decently. And yeah, just a lot of people yeah. came in. You can also look at 2020. Obviously, the pandemic was a big thing, but 2020 was the year we got baby persistence when we didn't lose our, con our, our, our content every single quarter. And that made a huge yeah. difference to people. A lot, of, a lot more people played after that. And I think, like you're saying, you know, 1.0 release um, is is a big deal because that not only shows that they're building a game, it shows that they have a plan for something that people can see hit a release date and then actually play. And if they can really reach that level, I keep saying it, I think they can make way more money selling cheaper items to a way more massive audience than they could selling expensive ships to a, a, the relatively small group that is following the game right now. Yeah, I think they'll, they'll definitely be way more successful when they're making much more numerous small transactions versus these large uh, single transactions. I want to go back to the, the, the 1.0 diagram that, that you posted here, because I think you are absolutely by the way, right. 
by the way, I want to contextualize what I'm saying. Um, when I'm saying them making money, I think we often, we skip the part where we, ex- we explain why it's important for them to make money. I want the, the project to succeed and that's why I want them to make money. Right. It's not because yeah. I want somebody to buy a yacht or a mansion. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure I want everybody at CIG to have mansions and yachts. I would love for everybody to have those, but I want the game to succeed because I I really like the game. So they need to make money to make it succeed. Yeah. I mean, most really, people just want to see a cool game. Yeah. It hundred percent depends on, on the people buying ships right now. So, and, and what you said, I think, I think that is absolutely true. Most people just want to see a game like, yep. Take all of the hardcore features that they've proposed for this game, and I'm sure there are plenty of people who would like those features, but I think the majority of people just want them to finish something that's fun and sticks to the big design goals they've laid out. Like, the difference between whether or not there's a crosshair or not is not going to change the game for that many people. The difference between whether you can slide or not, whether the FPS radar goes through walls or not, all of these things obviously make a difference and people care about them, but they're they're definitely not going to define the game or how many people you know, join it. These are, these are small fry things. It's more stuff like this, the 1.0 vision of what the ultimate game loop is, not just a professional game loop, but like, what is the point of moving and progressing through the game? And I agree with you. This was such a great thing for them to lay out because it goes beyond the whole, oh, I'm grinding to just get more money to buy more ships or, oh, I'm grinding to get more items to do more things. It's like showing that there is a part of the game you have to play to earn the things you want to do so that you can do higher quality missions and then unlock more parts of the game. And that's a full loop. The one thing that, that got me during this, this part he was talking about this was that he talked about how all of this loop, everything that they came up with throughout this process, for those of you who are just listening, we're just looking at the, the, the game loop that was laid out during the star citizen 1.0 panel with the green line that goes around the guilds and ships and all that stuff. When he, laid this out, he said that the ultimate goal for this was to get the F7A. And he can't get the F7A because it's a military ship, so he has to get the blueprint for it. And that's what causes the whole game loop. But then that kind of brings into clarity, I think, for a lot of people. Buying ships can remove a large part of the motivation in this game. Not to say that all of the motivation is surrounding ships, But if your motivation in this specific scenario was to unlock a military ship, which you can't buy, you have to craft, so you have to get the blueprint, so you have to earn the reputation to get the blueprint, you have to do the missions to earn that reputation, that's all gone if you just went and bought an F7A. And that's not me advocating for people to not buy ships, but more to bring awareness to folks that a lot of the enjoyment of this game will come from not having the ships that you want. And that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. But I I think that um, you can't stop people from buying cool space, internet spaceships. It's because they're available that people will buy cool internet spaceships. I think the real issue is, I mean, I think saying that is definitely is is a good point, but I think the, the real, uh, the real solution lies with CIG's decision-making on some of this stuff. I think they've kind of put themselves in a bit of a corner uh, with selling every ship because it's, it's created a situation where progression no longer is going to be that interesting to a large portion of the existing player base. Not even a corner. They dug a a ditch and they threw themselves in there. (laughs) They, they threw themselves in there and broke their legs in the process. Like it, it is, it is a tough situation they put themselves into. And so they've been trying to think of other ways to do progression through the years. And they've talked about reputation as one possible solution. And I think crafting, uh, and leveling up your ship, this is a very intriguing thing. I've still got some question marks on, uh, but it, it's an intriguing idea that your base level ship that you've purchased for money is like a tier one or tier two level yeah, one or level one. two. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that you can get up to level five I don't know how you get there. What that means is like you have much better components or like the hull itself is literally being like added to like, I'm I'm not, they have to expand on this a bit more, but the idea is really interesting to me. And I like this idea that, yeah, you can buy a ship, but you still need to work on it to make it the best ship. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that that's one possible solution, but certainly one of the things they definitely need to stop doing is at some point selling every single ship. Yeah. (laughs) everything uh, like yeah 
especially new ships. I mean, like there has to come a point where they just make ships for the game for inside the game for you to earn. And they just have to trust that knowing that is in the game to work towards is Dude. going to make people want to play oh, the game and man. be there. We are the dying time, right? for this. I think at this point we are freaking dying for this. It's been yeah. years since that Halloween event where they allowed people to earn that helmet in game during the Could event. You, like we lost was a, it for that. It was a stupid reskin to, oh, well, not even talking about the Vandu helmet. The Vandu helmet was a bit more unique, but it was like, think of this. It's just a stupid helmet. Think of it were a ship, a unique ship, how crazy people would go over that in the current state of Star Citizen to earn a new ship in the game. Yeah. It would be wild. And, and like I hope everybody, that we can have that. And everybody will cheese it at the beginning, of course, just like during that mm -hmm. Halloween event. People will Congo line. They'll do all their exploits and stuff to earn that ship. Sure. Okay. We, we get the edge cases where people will, will just break the game in order to get the new thing. But this adds so much for the people who come in next year two years down the line three years down the line it's not content mm -hmm. that just leaves being able to earn something in the game and then never making that able to be purchased allows so many more people in the future to also benefit from the added quality that that adds to the game and people are hurting to just be able to earn something in the game that feels worth the time i'm not trying to say that if something is purchasable that automatically makes it not worth getting in game but i do think that i think it diminishes its value yeah, substantially the, it certainly hurts the motivation to get it and it it hurts again the processes like this that can be brought up to say you're doing all of this because you're there's no other way to get that ship because some people will look at this and even though they want to get the gameplay in even though they want to spend that time enjoying the game Sometimes you just can't beat the power of the credit card for some folks. And you're like, well, you know, it's, the, it's, like, it's like when I want to have multiple cookies. I just discovered that Costco makes very good cookies. And like, maybe I want to have two of those cookies. Maybe I want to buy two and take them home. Or I could buy one and then go and be a responsible dude and like eat other things that are good and then come back to get that cookie later unfortunately i'm i just don't have that that responsibility so i have to live myself buy one cookie and not get both of them same thing goes for ships for a lot of people the ship is there yeah i don't want to buy it but it's there so i'm gonna I'm a pick it up and uh that kind of wipes out that possible game loop for some people not again saying that yeah. it does it automatically or it's a problem with the game just the fact that the choice is there can mm -hmm. hurt people's ability to i think enjoy more of what the game offers you know, one of the things that I think is really refreshing is they were talking about how the only way to get this F7A was to earn it in game. Although the, I think the use that I would want to ask, if I could ask Richard Tyre another question, it would be, uh, did you just give that example out of hand because you, you just came to mind or are you actually thinking of some more unique ships that we can not actually purchase? Because I, I would like to see that be the case and more of a committal, a committal on that. Um, because I think it would, it would it would stop some of the arguments I've seen in the community. There's there is a portion of the community, and I don't want to dismiss their feelings because you know they like the game too. But I definitely don't agree with the position that everything should be purchasable on the website. That there should be nothing that is out of reach of a credit card uh, because it's supposed to be a sandbox, and I don't have the time to play a game. Um, I, I personally don't like that approach i think what makes a game interesting is progression what makes a game interesting and worth playing is uh, the the goal at the end of the road to to try to earn something and then to have that as a as a trophy as a as a reward to kind of show to other people that you have a, you have achieved this thing and what i think makes what what the value what i'm talking about when i say value has been diminished by purchasing a ship on the website is that when you look at somebody else flying that big polaris around you know that they didn't earn that polaris through fighting through countless battles you know that they you know swiped a credit card that's how they got the polaris and it, i think it somewhat diminishes the awe in seeing that ship oh yeah for sure i think that's what you know actually going back to the presentation learning that the Bengal would be able to be constructed in other very large capital ships through building a, a base. 
I think that ship is going to inspire awe in a way that other ships just haven't. Uh, because it will require so much in-game effort in order to maintain, well. uh, sorry, to build, to maintain, to retain. Uh, that's the kind of feeling that I want to see more in Star Citizen, is when I look at something, I'm like, damn, that is that is so cool. I want, I want to earn that. I mean, I could see them doing that with some of the new squadron ships, for example, that very sexy F7X in the oh F, uh, F8 Mark II. Oh, so, that F7X, so holy beautiful. crap. Holy crap. <laughs> I mean, I think people would, I think people would, uh, would level mountains just to get the skins on that and earn those in game. So yeah, like, but CIG, I mean, the, dude. <laughs> the bar has been set real low. It's, you know, it's in, in CIG's court. There's so many things that they could do to make people like go crazy to play the game and earn stuff. I think they really that's wouldn't also, have to spend so much effort. <laughs> that's also something that they really could have, we could have benefited from them talking about when it came to Star Citizen 1.0 is monetization plans and like customization plans. They really glossed over customization. They were like, yeah, you can uh, get skins and put them on your base and you can change colors. And it's like, can we select the colors? Are you selling the patterns? Are you selling the paints? How are you making money? How does customization work? Um, that would yeah. that would have been solid to know, I think, for that section of the of the talk. But also going back to the panel or the bangle, do you think there's a chance that they will ever try and sell that ship now? I would I would not be foolish enough to say that CIG would never sell a ship. I think we've gone we've we've crossed the Rubicon on that. And They've that... sold a number of ships. They said they never would, <laughs> and and I think that that there's no, it's not out of the realm of possibility See, that, they would sell that a bundle. Sucks. I think it it sucks that we can't be sure of that because, like you just said, the fact that they're offering that to be crafted could completely change the the awe level that you see seeing it. Could level mountains for people to make it, yeah. and then boom, they hey, now they sold it. Hey, hey, corporate, my. Uh, the, the the executives who make the the money decisions my disappointment is not permission for you to sell the bengal okay i'm not i'm not <laughs> making this okay i'm not normalizing this please don't do it oh my god chris if if you know tell them no please if, and thank you so much for watching the podcast if you are especially like an hour and a half into it yeah um yeah i think the the, the bengal being built is cool i think um they need to not sell ships but then and this also goes towards the progression that they've set up the idea that like yeah. hey you can buy big ships if you want but if you don't have the rep progression with guilds and stuff they're not going to give you the missions that will actually pay for the upkeep of those ships so buying a big ship is not the only thing you need to do you need to be able to also support that big ship through players through services through all that kind of stuff and it helps to slow down that advance to win aspect of just going into the store and buying a ship but and this goes for basically everything we've been talking about here if they're selling currency is that all moot uh i think they have to sell currency sadly uh because there's no way for them to stop gold sellers from existing you could there's, there's literally nothing they can do any system any countermeasure whether human or artificial, it's my strong belief that that Chinese bots will always figure a way around it. So, so the idea is gold sellers are making money in game and then selling it for real money. Right, right. They're going to do it no matter what. And if you let them do that, they can severely affect the value of things in game. They can kill the in game economy. I've seen it happen before. So the only way to stop that is for you to sell gold yourself and basically make it, uh, put limits on how much they can inf inflate the economy uh, and, and make things over overpriced. Man, that's it's rough. a sad and ugly reality of uh, of the game. Now, I think there's other ways to prevent you from buying your way through everything. Uh, for example, reputation is non-transferable. It's not something you could farm and give to other people. And it should be an added component to buying certain elements. Like you need to have a certain amount of reputation, uh, maybe reputation points or, or, or merits or something in order for you to purchase 
say a military grade thing from a military warehouse, just giving you an example or mm -hmm. uh, to, to have access to uh, participate in an instant fleet battle that would have the reward of the blueprint. So yeah. there'd be ways for you to not be able to swipe your card through everything. That money would not be the be all end all of all power. Uh, but that's certainly something that they're going to have to delicately balance yeah. because if, if money has no value, then nobody will buy it. And then <laughs> They don't make any money. So it's uh, it's a balance they'll have to strike. It's a tough one. All right, man. Well, to, to wrap up this whole conversation, meandering all over the place, um, I guess going back to the main topic of the talk is, is Star Citizen 1.0 properly looking like Star Wars Galaxies 2, in your opinion? Yes. Because we'll never get Star Wars Galaxies 2. I'm sorry to everybody keeping their hopes <laughs> up. It's never going to happen. Is it, is it going to be good enough, though, to be that? Uh, I hope so. But obviously, there's no way of me knowing. We yeah. just have to wait and see. Yeah, I guess based um, on the design more so. Yeah, if they can realize the design, it seems like it, it will be uh, a much better version of Star Wars Galaxies. That's cool, because I've heard really good things, and I did not get to play it. And I'm a graphics snob, so going back and playing very old games emulated kind of I, get a little difficult i think one of the things that's missing that would really like to see is uh clothing that's crafted and that the crafted clothing could be customized a little bit like different colors uh because that that made crafted clothing a lot more interesting like the the stuff that npcs would sell would be really basic in color so if you wanted something more interesting and unique you'd have to go to a player uh, a player city or a player crafter in order to get that cool color set that you wanted. Uh, like I remember going to a, a, uh, a, a tailor who made me an entire set of clothing in one theme to look like a, you know, a Jedi on Tatooine. And I was really happy to pay them to do that. Cause it, it was a really great ensemble. Like that whole thing to do the RP that I want to do was, was done by one person. I, it, would, it would be great if we could have that. They didn't really, go too much in depth with yeah. how that might work so i'd like them to to think to consider that that'd be cool because then you could have harvestables be able to be refined into dyes and that's mm -hmm. a, that's mm -hmm. just like that's a lot more crafting potential for people out in the forest doing science stuff coming up with dyes yeah, it can be it can be a unified system between ship paints and uh clothing paints so it could be you have to find this thing to make this dye for both to make the paints pretty sick you know that'd be cool i think that'd be great all right man well, thanks again for joining for this talk coming to, I think, a conclusion a lot of people probably want to hear. I know that was a that's a I'm excited to experience more of that Star Wars Galaxy spirit that people always talk about in a game that I already enjoy. So, yeah, I appreciate it. I, I think talk. it's it looks like it's going in that direction, but don't buy it based on the idea that it will definitely will be. We don't know. Sure. Yeah, sure. Just a lot of the same kind of targets. Um mm -hmm. Would you like to let everybody know where they can find your own content, the stuff you're putting out? Sure. You can find me on uh, Space Tomato Gaming. Uh, <laughs> you can tell from the background. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I am Space Tomato. Who are you? Uh, okay, oh, uh, Morphologist. That's a nice place um, you got there. Wow. No, I know. It's, isn't it great? I've just uh, I've got some really cool lights back there. You see that? Yeah, one That's of them's my, off, my, though. My, oh, my, I, have to, I have to get that one fixed. <laughs> Should try, try and do it like mine here. <laughs> I've got, uh, yeah, I will, I will try for the next one. Um, I, uh, you can find me at Morphologist at YouTube. I'm also on Twitter. I'm also on TikTok as well. I post, I've been posting some shorts on there. And uh, occasionally I post some, some things on other platforms. But mostly it's YouTube, Twitch, and on Twitter. Awesome, man. And TikTok. Well, and, and you guys can also find him on multiple past episodes of the launch sequence or on Citizen Central, where we've had great talks about other Star Citizen things. I'm sure both hating and shilling on the game. It's just kind of how it goes naturally. Um, thanks again for joining me, Morph. Appreciate you. Thank you, everybody, for listening and or watching if you're on YouTube. Our supporters here in the live chat, folks, this is a big room. I hope you guys enjoyed the live show. Thank you for your commentary and your questions. If you are a supporter here on Twitch, on Patreon, on YouTube, wherever, you can come and join us live. They, we do this every week, um, and it's a good time. You get to hear the gossip before and after. Either way, though, thanks again for joining me, everybody. I will see you all next week. Bye.